Hello and welcome to Baiju's Exam Prep IAS. Before we begin today's session of the Hindu analysis, an important announcement for all of you. From today onwards, you will be able to download the PPT that we use in the CNA session. All the content that you see on the PPT will be given to you. The link to download that PPT is given in the description of the video starting from today. I hope that will be helpful for all of you. Now let's begin today's discussion with the first article that is written by Mr. Subramanyam Swami. He is also well known for his views about the Indian economy and he has been a member of parliament for six terms. The point that he is making here is that India is committing a big mistake by remaining neutral in the ongoing Russia-Ukraine crisis. As you know, India has abstained from voting in the United Nations when there was a resolution introduced against Russia's aggression on Ukraine. Mr. Swami, who himself is a BJP member right now, says that India must tread very carefully and we must choose peace over war. He says that there is no reason to support what Russia is doing right now, even though the fact is that we are dependent on Russia for a lot of things, including our defense manufacturing. Mr. Swami in this article gives a lot of examples of why exactly Russia is in the wrong right now. He starts his article by quoting what Vladimir Putin had said. If you remember Vladimir Putin, while announcing that he will undertake a special military operation, had said that he wants denazification of Ukraine. Now, this is very strange. Denazification means getting rid of the Nazis. Nazis were in Germany, led by Hitler, who wanted to kill all the Jews and who wanted to establish the supremacy of Germany. The interesting part is today, both the Prime Minister and the President of Ukraine themselves are Jews. The community who was targeted by the Nazis. Secondly, the family members of the president himself were killed by the Nazis in the Holocaust. So how is it that the president of Russia can say that he wants denazification of Ukraine? The entire justification that Russia is giving for attacking Ukraine is that the Ukrainian government has been oppressing people living in the eastern part of Ukraine, that is in the Donbass region, specifically because those people are of Russian origin. Mr. Swami in this article says that although Russia has been claiming that the Ukrainian government has been oppressing those people or there have been reports of genocide in this region, but the fact is that there is no documentation or there is no proof of anything like that happening. These are just false claims made by Russia to justify its invasion of Ukraine. In fact, Vladimir Putin has also said that Ukraine in itself is an illegitimate country. Meaning that according to him, Ukraine as a country has no right to even exist. And thus the ultimate goal of Vladimir Putin right now seems to be that he wants to make Ukraine into a vassal state of Russia. A vassal state means a state which seems to be independent on the outset, but is run and controlled by Russia. Vladimir Putin wants to take back Russia to the days of the Soviet Union when Russia headed a large empire which had many of today's countries under itself. In fact, Vladimir Putin has multiple times said that the collapse of the Soviet Union was a major geopolitical disaster and he wants to take Russia back to those days when it had under its control a lot of other nations including Ukraine, Georgia, Baltic nations, the Central Asian nations, etc. Now, after establishing that Vladimir Putin is making false claims about what is Ukraine doing in the eastern part, the author here switches to why India should choose its stand very carefully. As you know, India, Russia, China, all are members of the BRICS. Now, BRICS is a group that we had talked a lot about in 2018, 19, and it used to be a major priority for India. However, since the Quad has come into being, and since the Chinese aggression has started towards India, India's focus has shifted from BRICS to Quads. In fact, there is no major news that you see about India and BRICS in the past couple of years or so. The author, however, says that in the recent New Delhi declaration, the BRICS nations had resolved that all of them were opposed to any unilateral use of force against any state, not just the member states. And they all wanted that all the disputes should be resolved by peaceful means and ruled out the use of force against the territorial integrity of any state whatsoever. Since all the BRICS members agreed to this resolution, Russia by invading Ukraine is going against it. Thus, India needs to take a stand here. We cannot remain a mute spectator to what is happening because we were also party to this resolution. 
We are not saying that an action has to be taken against Russia on that regard. But the least that India can do right now is express its disappointment over the fact that one of the resolutions that India had signed is not being fulfilled by the other member states. The author says that India's dream and goal of becoming a Vishwa Guru would not convert into a reality if India continues on its current policy of not taking any stand and thinking for short term gains only rather than thinking about long term gains. The author says that India has failed to accept reality since its independence. Yes, India needs friends and collaborators, but that does not mean that India has to bow down in front of any country right now. India thus has to assert itself at the international stage. We can't argue that because it is not an issue where India is involved, we will not take a stand. Because if that is the case, then why is it that India is asking for a seat at the Security Council? Why is it that we are asking for a seat at other multilateral organizations? If we are only concerned about bilateral relations where India is involved, why is it that we want to be a part of the global affairs then? That is why the author says that India needs to assert itself and ask Russia to withdraw its armed forces from Ukraine. And also, the next time this resolution comes to vote in the UN, India must stand in favor of Ukraine and mention the fact that the Delhi resolution of BRICS has not been fulfilled by Russia. India must also learn the lesson that with China becoming increasingly aggressive, this will only give a further push to China to conquer India's territory illegitimately. And when India is taking such a stand at the international stage and not respecting sovereignty of other nations, India might face the same issue down the line. And that is why India must choose its path very carefully. One of the other things that we had discussed earlier was that the reason why India cannot openly take a stand against Russia is that our defense sector is still highly dependent on Russia's weapons. Now, let me give you a graph and some information to make you understand how dependent are we right now exactly on Russia's weapons. Now, if you see this graph from 1991 to 2020, you would see that India's buying from Russia has reduced drastically. However, this does not take into account India's recent order of S-400 missile defense system worth over $4 billion. Thus, even though our overall buying from Russia in terms of defense has decreased, but a lot of weapons that we have bought earlier needs to be refurbished, needs to be replaced, need to be serviced, and all of that needs collaboration from the Russian government. I also have a report for you from the US Congress. So the US Congress or the US Parliament, they keep on publishing a lot of reports on world affairs. One of the recent reports that they published in October 2021 talked about how Russia's weapon industry is catering to multiple nations across the world. And in that report, there is a section on India specifically. All the data that you see on the scene is taken from that Congress report of the US. It says that since 2010, Russia has been the source of two third of all the Indian arms imports and India has been the largest buyer of Russian arms, accounting for close to one third of all the Russian arms export. All the three arms of the Indian military, it is the Army, Air Force and Navy are highly dependent on Russia's weapon systems. For example, the Indian Army's main battle tank force is composed mainly of the Russian T-72 and T-90s with very few of the tanks of Indian origin. Indian Navy's only operational aircraft carrier right now is a refurbished Soviet era ship and it is made in a way that the fighter jets that are made in Russia can be accommodated on that ship easily. The Navy's sole nuclear powered submarine is also on lease from Russia only. However, even more than the Army or the Navy, it is the Indian Air Force that is even more dependent on Russian weapons right now. Out of the 667 plane fleet that we have in India, over 70% of those planes are of Russian origin. 39% being the Sukhois, 22% being the MiG-21s and 9% being the MiG-29s. Not just this, all six of Air Force's air tankers are Russian made. Add to that the fact that AK-203 assault rifles and Brahmos are some of the joint ventures taken by India and Russia and you would realize why the Indian government is hesitating to take even a single step against Russia right now. Although there has been a trend of India moving away from Russian weapon imports, but still if you look at the numbers between India and Russia about weapon trade, it is extremely high right now. That is why India must trade extremely carefully in the coming weeks. 
The next article that we have here talks about the issue of cyber attacks that not just India, but countries across the world are facing and what can be the possible solutions. The author here, who is a professor from IIIT Bangalore, says that the Ministry of Electronics and Information Technology is in the process of introducing a new cyber security regulation that mainly says that any organization be it the private organization or the government organization, must report any incident of cyber attack or data leak that they have to face. So, for example, if I run a private company and there has been an issue that my servers have been compromised or there's a cyber attack or some of the data of my customers has been leaked, then it is my responsibility that I will have to report such incident within 72 hours. That is what the Data Protection Bill of 2021 says. Now, why is it important? It is important because only and only when these organizations, including the government organizations, report incidents of cyber theft or cyber attacks, can other organizations be on alert and they can also understand how to fight against these attacks. The cyber crime magazine, which covers cyber attacks around the world, says that cyber attacks in 2021 globally inflicted a damage of about $6 trillion dollars. Except US and China, no other country in the world even has an entire GDP of $6 trillion. So understand the extent of problem that we are facing right now. Now, one of the reasons why any private organization usually does not report to the government authorities even when they face such attacks is because whenever such an incident comes to light, it has a very negative impact on the reputation of the organization. Let me give a very simple example. Let's say you order food from Swiggy also and Zomato also. All of a sudden, there was a news that Zomato's data was compromised. Some hackers attacked the servers of Zomato and all the data from Zomato was stolen, including the data of your saved credit card, your food history, etc. Now, from tomorrow onwards, if you have to make a choice on where do you have to order food, you might tilt towards Swiggy, thinking that my data might be more secured with Swiggy as compared to Zomato. So it will obviously give a negative reputation to the company who has been under the attack. And that is why the companies usually don't publicize such kind of information. Whenever a company has tried to do that, their share prices have usually seen a 3.5% decline over the next three months and about 8.6% decline over the next one year. Thus, there is no incentive for the companies to report such attacks. In fact, on the other hand, they just have to lose if they report such attacks on their servers. Now, the point is, if the companies are not coming forward to report these attacks, what can be done? So what the government can do is they can set up a regulator who conducts periodic cyber security audits so that they can themselves get to know if there has been a cyber security breach, even without the companies reporting it. There are other possible solutions that can be imposed. For example, the government should take help of a third party cyber security auditors so that periodic cyber security audits can be conducted amongst not just private organizations, but all the government departments as well. Because in the past few years, what we have seen is that cyber warfare has become a reality. Countries such as US, UK, Russia, etc. are spending a lot of money in training hackers and making them a part of their military. So government to government hacking has become a reality in the past few years. And that is why we need to put special attention on the government data, government departments, both at the national and at the state level. The ministry has also set up a common criteria testing laboratories and certification bodies across the country to certify cyber security agencies. Such kind of schemes can also be extended to certify those agencies that will undertake audits and assessments of the organizations. A good example from the private sector is of the IBM. IBM has a cyber security command center in Bangalore. Other major firms can also learn from this and they can also set up such centers specifically to ensure that any cyber attacks against their systems can be neutralized. Now on that note, it is also important to know what exactly are we doing right now to strengthen our cyber security in India. Now the fact is that in 2013, the government of India released a national cyber policy. In 2020, there were talks about that policy being refurbished and changed according to the present situation. Now, the need for that policy is because of many reasons. First, as I said, there are cyber warfare that are becoming a reality in today's time. There are constant cyber attacks that are sponsored by governments across the world. 
governments of UK, China, Russia, Israel, etc. are spending a lot of money in developing their cyber warfare capabilities. Not just this, over the past few years, a lot of critical infrastructure of the nation has all shifted online. In fact, even the nuclear power plants that we see, even the electricity grids that we see right now are all operated online with the help of information technology. Meaning that while on one hand they have become much more efficient and we are not relying on people to people interaction. On the other hand, they are susceptible to such attacks and that is why there is a need to ensure their safety. Then we also have to ensure that the critical sectors are well taken care of. At a time that we are entering the 5G era, we have to make sure that all our online systems are protected against any attacks. Just in 2020, there were close to 7 lakh cyber security incidents that were seen across the world in just the first 8 months of 2020 year. India and other countries also have faced cyber attacks recently on a large scale. You would have seen during the first COVID wave in Mumbai, there was a blackout where the entire city lost the power for some time. That was because of a malware by a Chinese group called the Red Echo that targeted India's power sector. The Chinese hacker group known as the Sone Panda has identified gaps and vulnerabilities in the Indian IT infrastructure and supply chain software of Bharat Biotech and even the Serum Institute of India. All these attacks are sponsored by the governments of other nations and that is why we have to be extra careful. What we have done is, we have taken up initiatives such as the Cyber Surakshit Bharat Initiative, the Cyber Swachta Kendra, Online Cyber Crime Reporting Portal, etc. The government of India also has set up a dedicated organization to look into these incidents, which is called CERT-IN. CERT-IN stands for Indian Computer Emergency Response Team. It was established in the year 2004 under the Ministry of Electronics and Information Technology and they have to serve as a national agency while performing the functions such as collecting data about any cyber incidents taking place in the country, alerting any cyber security incidents that might happen in the near future, taking up emergency measures, coordinating with other organizations working in this field, giving guidelines and advisories about how to deal with such attacks, etc. Interestingly, India is not a signatory to the Budapest Convention on Cybercrime, which is the first international treaty that seeks to address internet and cybercrime by harmonizing national laws and improving the investigative techniques in this particular regard. The next article that we have takes us back to the Silver Line Project, a news that we have discussed multiple times in our CNAs. If you have not followed it till now, let me give you a refresher very quickly. The state government of Kerala has been trying to go ahead with the Silver Line Rail Project. The Silver Line Rail Project will connect the southernmost and the northernmost part of the state of Kerala by providing high speed rail connectivity. For instance, right now the travel time by train between Tiruvananthapuram and the Kasagod district which is in the north part of Kerala is about 12 hours. With this high speed rail project, the distance will be converted to just 4 hours. However, there have been a lot of debate about this project. There are people on the one side who are saying that the project is not needed. It will lead to environmental issues. It would also lead to unnecessary expense of the government of Kerala. On the other hand, the people supporting it say that this is a need of the hour. The state must progress economically and this can be a turning point in Kerala becoming an economic hub for the country. The author here is on the second side of the argument. He says that the Silver Line project is a project that is the need of the hour, which will convert Kerala into economic hub and create a lot of jobs within the state, thus not forcing people to go out of the states to take up new jobs. The author has compared the experience of Kerala with that of the Japanese government. In the 1950s, the Japanese government started building the world's first ever high-speed rail called the Shinkansen. Now, at that time when Japan was undertaking such a project, they faced similar kind of criticism that the Kerala government is facing. If you realize, at the end of the Second World War, Japan was devastated, their economy was in pieces, and at that time in the 1950s, to think about developing world's first ever high-speed rail was not an idea that many people had supported. Many people criticized Japan, thinking that this idea would be an epic fail, and Japan would only drown in the debt. However, that did not happen. 
In fact, today the Shinkansen Railway project is a symbol of Japan's economic resurgence and this technology has been exported to many nations including India as well which is thinking about using the same technology for the Mumbai Ahmedabad high speed railway project. The author says that since 1980s Kerala has been at the top position in terms of public health education in the entire country. So much so it is comparable to the East Asian tiger economies which we look up to in India. However, it has not really received a lot of public sector investment due to various reasons. Kerala is one of the largest exporters of skills right now with somewhere between 10 to 15 lakh of people from Kerala being employed in high skilled jobs including nurses, engineers, teachers, media professionals etc. But the reality is that most of them are working outside the state or even outside the country. Meaning that while the people of Kerala have the skills, they have the knowledge, but they don't have the jobs within their state and that is why they would have to move out. That is because of lack of economic activities in Kerala. Now two main sectors which earn most of the revenue for Kerala are tourism and information technology. However, these are not enough for accommodating the kind of population that Kerala has. Anyways, in the post-pandemic world, as per the author, the companies are now seeking places that are greener and even less congested so that they can set up new offices. And that is where Kerala offers a great advantage. But for that to convert into a reality, the state must have an effective public transport system. The silver line can resolve that issue. It can turn into what the local train is doing for Mumbai or what the underground railways is doing for London. Although the maximum speed of this train can be 320 km per hour, the Kerala government is already planning to use up till 200 km per hour to cover the entire distance from north to the south of the state within 4 hours. This project will not just modernize the economy, it would create a lot of new jobs. Now in the last part of the article, the author is trying to debunk the myth from the other side of the argument. Number one, he says that people are saying it will harm the environment. Now in the short term, yes, any construction project will automatically harm the environment because you would have to cut some trees, you would have to make changes in the landscape, etc. However, he says that in the long run, public transport systems such as this will obviously run on renewable energy only. Not just this, it would carry more than 10 lakh people every day. Now, since those people would be in the train, that means they would not be driving their personal vehicles. That means there would not be any congestion on the road. There would not be any accident on the road. The fuel consumption would reduce. So in the long run, it is a brilliant idea. Over the last decade or so, the number of motor vehicles in the states have doubled and so have the rate of accidents. And to accommodate that, the government either has to build multi-lane highways or such a project. Now, if you compare this project with a, let's say, six-lane national highway, such a highway would need double the land that is required for this rail project and would only be able to carry one-third of the traffic. The other myth, according to the author, that many people are propagating is that the rail project will be about 7.5% of Kerala's annual income. Thus, the state will be under a lot of debt after this project. But the problem is that the people here are assuming that the income of Kerala state will remain the same throughout, which is not the case. Even when the center government takes a debt for our budget, we always assume that in the coming years our income will increase and that is how we will be able to pay back the debt. And the same will happen today. The economy will not stay where it is right now. It will obviously move on and we will be able to repay the debt very easily. The third fear that people have is that it might lead to natural calamities. However, when you see the example of Japan, Japan is a country that is prone to a lot of earthquakes. But still, the Japanese high-speed rail network has seen no fatal accidents in the last six decades or so, which is a prime example of what can be achieved if your technology is up to date and that is why Kerala should also follow the same idea. Now, just a refresher on what exactly will be the areas that will be connected by the Silver Line project. This is the landscape of Kerala. This project is intended to connect Kasargod district with Tiruvananthapuram. So from the northern part till the southern part, the journey which right now takes 12 hours will be converted to a 4 hour journey. Now to summarize it, there are pros and cons of this project. The pros include that Kerala's heavily choked highways will be eased off, lesser congestion on the roads, lesser accidents, lesser consumption of the fuel. 
it will benefit the tourism industry also because tourists will be able to travel to more places and they can have a much better experience. It will also help in connecting the IT corridors, techno parks, info parks, etc. The concerns on the other hand obviously start from the environmental side. Environmental clearances have to be taken because of a lot of land accusation. About 10,000 families will have to be displaced, taken to a new area. So their rehabilitation also has to be a top priority. The next article that we have here talks about the ongoing protest over the Diocha Pachmi coal block in the state of West Bengal. Now, the simple story is that the West Bengal government in 2018 was given the go ahead by the central government to extract coal from this area. Now, extracting coal from this area, which is huge, would mean that the people living in this particular area would have to be displaced. Now, the state government is trying to acquire that particular piece of land. The entire coal block is about 3,400 acres, out of which the government of West Bengal right now owns about 1,000 acres. So, from the remaining 2,400 acres, the villagers that are living, the tribal population that is living would have to be displaced. Now, these tribal populations are not willing to leave that area because they think that the government is not offering them enough compensation. And that is what has led to all this problem. The Diocha Pachmi coal block is considered to be the largest coal block in the entire country and covers about 12 villages and a population of about 21,000 people, most of whom are scheduled castes or scheduled tribes. Interestingly, many of the people living in these areas are from the Santhal tribe who are very closely related to their land and forest and are dependent for their needs on the forest. That has led to many organizations coming in support of these villagers, including the Sanyuk Kisan Morcha that was in Delhi also over the farm bill protest, the JNU Student Union, the Bangla Sanskriti Manch and the Teachers Against Climate Crisis. All of these are coming up in support of the villagers. Now, the government on the other hand, recently increased the package of rehabilitation that was offered to the villagers. So the earlier package was much lower and now they will be given a much higher price by the government for their land. But even then the people are not ready to surrender their land to the government. Apart from the villagers not willing to give away their land, the other problem is that the environmental clearance of this project is still awaited and has not been made public for the people. Now, the government on the other side is saying that this project is for the welfare of the people of the state. They say that over 1 lakh jobs will be created for the people of West Bengal through mining. Not just this, as I said, the state government has revised the rehabilitation package, which will cost about 10,000 crore to the state of West Bengal. Under the revised package now, a person giving his or her land to the state government will get double the market value. Not just this, these people would also be given a separate house to live. A separate house will be given for all the adults member of the family having an area from 600 to 700 square feet. People who don't want to take these built up houses can take money also against that particular house, which will be 7 lakh rupees per family. In the earlier package, it was only 5 lakh rupees per family. The original package had said that one member of every family will be given a job at the junior police constable level. But in the revised package, the government says that those people who have a higher qualification than what is required at the police constable level will be getting a higher grade posting in the police or an equivalent posting in the other government departments. Not just this, there are many people who don't own a land but live in that area for a long time. So people who have been living in that area for a long time but don't have official ownership of the land they would also be given a land ownership and a compensation package. Thus, the government is making every bit of effort to ensure that the NT industry image of West Bengal gets refurbished. Now, when you read this, it is very interesting to see how life takes a full circle. It's very funny if you actually look at the history of West Bengal, the government that is ruling. Now, the reason why Mamta Benazi actually became famous in West Bengal was because of a similar kind of project in Singur. So what happened was that in 2007, the Tata Motors announced that they will be building Nano and they want to set up a manufacturing plant for Nano. And that is when they decided on West Bengal, they wanted to acquire a lot of land because manufacturing plant for cars required a huge amount of land. And it was Mamta Benerjee who led the protest against the Tata Motors. She told the farmers that no, you should not give away your land. They are giving you lesser prices. 
and it went on for such a long time that tata motors eventually had to move out of west bengal and shift their factory to gujarat this was her claim to fame and now when she is in power she is facing the same issue of people not giving away land so let's see how she handles it now when you read this article there are a lot of takeaways and important topics from where you can actually get a lot of other information there are three points from this topic over which i would like you to have a good information number one the problem of land acquisition in india in india acquiring land is one of the most difficult things for the government irrespective of whoever is in power since our independence the governments over the years have had a very hard time in taking over land for development projects the second issue that we have here is the coal sector in india the coal sector in india coal mining coal block allocation has always been at the center of controversy so read a bit about the recent controversy that we have had in the coal sector so that you can add this also to the list the third issue that we have is recently raguram rajan that is the ex governor of the rbi recently gave a lecture at the st stephen's college and also wrote a very interesting article in that article he said that india cannot afford to focus on manufacturing because that will never be india's strength and india should move towards focusing on services and how exactly can we make the best use of services because manufacturing in india would require a lot of land acquisition and that is a problematic thing because we are not china we are not russia who can forcefully acquire land so i want you to read about that article as well so i will discuss about the land acquisition but i want you to read up on the coal sector problems and raguram rajan's latest lecture in the st stephen's college which is very important for you now the land acquisition in india is governed under the right to fair compensation and transparency in land acquisition rehabilitation and resettlement act of 2013 which came into force in jan 2014 interestingly before that the law of land acquisition in india was as old as 1894 this law says that the government can acquire land for its own use hold or control land including the public sector undertakings under this act the government will acquire the land for the purpose of transferring it to the private organizations now the provisions of this particular act do not apply to certain pieces of land such as a special economic zones land acquired for economic energy purposes railways etc now there are a lot of provisions of this particular law which are under criticism for example people say that this particular law is loaded in favor of the land owners and does not really look into the consideration of the people who are from poor families it is also not very clear on how the compensation prices will be decided by the government of india and apart from that the law says that the land will be acquired for public purposes but it does not really define what exactly would be a public purpose now this particular law in itself has a lot of provision and a lot of other details which i would suggest you to read upon some of the suggestions on how to make land acquisition in india much more transparent includes having a land auction rather than actually the government deciding the compensation let the farmers decide at what price do they want to sell their land and let's see if the private sector or the government can outbid them or can match their requirement or not also the farmers or the land owners should be decided to choose how they want to have their compensation it can be in the form of land it can be in the form of money it can be in the form of something else but let the people decide how do they want to be compensated all these suggestions can be incorporated to improve the provisions of land acquisition in india the next article that we have talks about one simple word that is finlandization now what exactly is this now this is a very interesting relationship between two neighbors as you can imagine one of these is finland and the other is russia or the soviet union of earlier times now finland and soviet union have a very interesting relationship that is governed by the 1948 finno soviet treaty under this treaty in simple terms the soviet union asked finland not to join nato and in return had a security guarantee from the soviet union that we will not attack you and you have our protection since then finland is kind of under the protective umbrella of russia it has not faced any attack from russia but on the other hand what has happened is there is constant interference in the internal affairs of finland at the hands of russia 
so much so that russia if they don't like a particular person who has won the election in finland they make it very clear and they want regime to be changed in finland this is called finlandization that is finland being a small country sustaining itself by accepting the fact that we are not as strong as our neighbors and it is in our best interest to be kind of subordinate to our neighbors and do whatever they want us to do this is governed by the 1948 treaty signed between the two countries thus finland till today has not joined nato although it maintains good relationship with the western countries today much better than what it used to have in 1948 but still it has kept itself outside nato now there were a few hiccups in between the two sides for instance in 1958 karl august fejerholm became the new prime minister of finland This new prime minister was not very really liked by the Soviet Union and Soviet Union wanted to replace him. However, although the prime minister was not replaced, but it did lead to a lot of interference from the Soviet Union in the internal affairs of Finland. Like India, Finland also has the office of prime minister and the office of the president. So the good part at that time for Soviet Union was that the president of Finland, that is Mr. Kekkonen, was in favor of the Soviet Union. and that is how the two nations started to come even closer mr kekkonen because he was favoring the soviet union the soviet union made sure that he keeps on winning elections so much so that he remained the president till 1982 for 26 years in finland they had the same president because soviet union just did not want him to lose any elections and that is how much interference the soviet union had inside finland Although Finland is a democratic country, people vote from their own will. But at the end of the day, who will win the election will be decided by the Soviet Union. In the current context, the reason why we are discussing this is that many international experts have suggested that the way to stop this crisis between Russia and Ukraine is for Ukraine to have Finlandization of some kind. That is, Ukraine also kind of signing a treaty with Russia, saying that number one, we will not join NATO. Secondly. we will not take any step against your own interest that is the solution that many people had suggested but the problem is that that stage is now past why because russia has already invaded ukraine not just this russia is not the kind of power that it used to be now the second power in the world apart from us is china and not really russia that is why the cold war situation and the post cold war situation is not really the same In fact not just Ukraine the concept of finlandization is also being talked about for Taiwan. Now in the situation where we have seen that US and NATO did not really come to save Ukraine maybe because US thought that we don't want two nuclear power nations head to head the problem is what happens to Taiwan now China is seeing that if Russia attacked Ukraine no one came to save it. Now what stops China from taking a similar step against Taiwan? they also know that taiwan although has a security guarantee from us but it is not a nato member so us has not treaty bound to come and safeguard taiwan so for taiwan also it may be a case of thinking whether or not they want to have a same treaty with china but again taiwan has time and time again said that we don't want to have any such kind of relationship with china and we are an independent nation altogether now if you look at the map of the region you realize how finland is one of those countries which share a land border with russia and they have accepted that the way for them to remain independent the way for them to ensure that they are not attacked by russia is to follow that 1948 treaty now one of the other reasons why this particular term actually came in the news was that recently when the french president went to meet vladimir putin to convince him not to attack ukraine many media reports suggested that the french president macron might have suggested to putin that don't attack ukraine rather than that you can sign a treaty with ukraine on these terms of finlandization but a few days later when french president macron came to ukraine to talk to the ukraine president and the media asked him why did you talk about ukraine without asking for their permission the french president <laughs> denied said no 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 i did not say anything like that to vladimir putin these are all false media reports so that is why this term has come in the news in the past few weeks or so that is why you must know what does it mean exactly these are the topics on today's hindu newspaper a couple of practice questions number 1 the real wars in the future would be fought online 
in this context give an account of india's preparedness to handle cyber security attacks from around the world second coal mining and coal block allocations have always been rife with controversy in india give reasons that lead to these problems both the questions have to be answered within 250 words each thank you so much for watching the video